Thanks, thanks very much, Francis. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Right, so supplying what the market wants that they've asked me to talk about today. So the first thing we'll do is we look at the overall cattle herd in Northern Ireland and what way it's going. Um, the key statistic here, I suppose, is your suckler cows. There's In December 2018, there's 5% decline in your suckler cow numbers. Um, and then to add on to that, in the first half of the year, um, registrations to suckler cows have fallen by 17,000. So it's quite a sizable. So you'll expect this figure to continue on into the December 2019 figures when they become available. Dairy cow numbers have also come back slightly and beef calf registrations to dairy cows have also come back, but nowhere near the same extent as the suckler cows. Um, other key statistics is the cattle in the under six months, six months to a year and one to two years. Um, these are December figures. So these cattle will be starting to come forward for slaughter um, towards the autumn. As you'll see, there's a decline in numbers. Um, there's been quite a strong cattle throughput this year but that's expected to tail off now in the last quarter of the year and into next year, um, just as these numbers, uh, these lower calf registrations start to come through for slaughter. So where is our end market for beef? Um, we produce about 460,000 uh, cattle a year for slaughter. Um, about 10,000 of these are exported live to the south, um, which account for about 2% of our total output. So the rest are processed here. And what is processed here? 80% ends up in the a UK retail market is probably our highest return in the market, so that'll be all your, your primals and your big cuts. Then the other 20% is destined at the minute for the EU market. This is more stuff that we don't really use, like, uh, well, not used, but underused, like four quarters, flanks, that sort of thing, that be really isn't used by the EU mar or the UK market at the minute. The EU market is a very important carcass balancing function because it takes this 20% of the beef that we don't use to full capacity, and then it also takes all of our offals as well. So, so access to that's very important. So these are our beef exports. You'll see that the, um, the EU is our major export destination for beef. Um, Ireland, France and the Netherlands take the largest proportion of it. In the first half of the year, our exports to the EU were up 2.3%. So our total exports were 62,000 tonne and 51 of it went to to the EU, so I think that highlights how important access to that market is for us. There's also a small but growing market for other countries, um, particularly Hong Kong, uh, South Africa, the Philippines, all have growing demand for, for beef and, uh, and meat products, um, some offals and things. Um, I suppose people here are becoming more affluent, more westernized diets, so there's, there's bigger demand for beef, so it's growing, it's growing quite strongly, but from a very small base. Um, uh, about 12%, or sorry, 19% of right, but of what was exported went to these markets, up from 12% in 2018. So it's still a very small market, but it is it is growing, and uh, hopefully um, there will be continued growth in that area. So this is the market specifications that we're all asked to comply with when we're taking cattle to slaughter. Um, the biggest reason people don't comply is usually carcass weight and grade. So carcass weight for steers at the minute, what they want ideally is a 280 to 380 kilo carcass. Um, as you'll see there in the second quarter of the year, 64% of what went through the major plants <coughs> met that specification. The biggest reason they're out of spec is there'll be a lot of uh, continental type steers producing carcasses over 400 kilos. Um, there's also some carcasses that are maybe underweight as well. Um, you know, maybe some like Angus and things like that uh, underneath. Grade then is the other one. You've got your gold box here, which is EUs, Rs, threes, four minuses, four equals, and O plus threes. And you'll see only 45% of steers and heifers met that spec. Um, the biggest reason for that lower figure is that there's a lot of Angus and Hereford in the kill that are graded like O minus, O equals, and then and four pluses on fat, which are outside the gold box. So this gold box at the minute uh, fulfills the most, the biggest range of retail specifications, which is why they ask for it. But you'll like see your Angus and your Hereford go in under different specifications. So then you've got your age of slaughter, 87% uh, hit that spec, 100% were UK origin, 99% had four farms or less when they were slaughtered, 100% were farm quality assured, and 94% fulfilled the more than 21 days in the last farm. These are all on retailer specifications that are asked for, and as you can see, we, we largely comply with them. So producing what the market wants. Um, as explained earlier there, what the one is an EU and R grading carcass um, to your left there. And then below here is 
how the grading has shifted. This is quarter two for up as far as 2019. And as you'll see, there's been a gradual shift away from you and our grading cattle more into ours and O's. And I suppose the main reason for that is that you've got more dairy cross cattle coming through the slaughter mix. Um, I mentioned earlier that there was less suckler cattle being registered. So there's more of these beef cross cows being registered that are now coming through in the kill. <coughs> and then you've got your the influence then of your Angus and your hair for more traditional breeds as well. So there's been a, a gradual movement downwards there in the confirmation. Then you've got your fat class, so that's the red box here. As you'll see, like the large majority of um of uh, prime cattle meet the meet that fat class specification. So that doesn't appear really to be an issue. So the importance of uh, weight specification, so the ideal weight range is 280 to 380 kilos. Um, it's really that's dictated by um, by a pack size. Um, th this is like your pack size, so the, the processor wants a cut that'll fit into that pack and it'll, look, it'll really look well on the supermarket shelf and that's what the consumer wants to buy. So it's, it's really um, about the aesthetics of the product. Um, the other thing is, is size of the product, the size of the individual cut. They obviously want it to fit in the pack. The, they're dictated by a price point. So the housewife has in her head that she wants to pay six pound for a pack of beef, and that's what she wants to pay. And they obviously then try and suit that. So the impact of this carcass weight, so I should probably mention steers and heifers. You'll see here the weight ranges. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of uh, heifers meet this spec. And you'll see here 14% of the steers are producing carcasses between 380 and 400 kilos, and another 18% are 400 to 450 kilos. And um, that's just in the second quarter of the year. So obviously these are outside what the, what the processors ideally want. So the incentive then to meet weight specification. There's penalties at the minute in place, like they're quoting £12 to £24 for um, for underweight carcasses for cattle, maybe the below like the 240 kilo weight range. And then penalties of overweight, they're generally like 10, 10 pay kilo up to maybe 20 pay kilo in some of the plants, but usually the 10. And they tend not to apply them until you cross the 400 kilo mark. Um, so we're looking then at the, the price, the value of your animal then. So 380 kilo carcass at 330 pence a kilo. This was done a few weeks ago, so the price is back a bit from that. So value 12.54. You push them onto 400 kilo carcass and it's worth 12.80. And a 420 kilo carcass is 13.44. So at a, at a rough guess, an extra 20 kilos carcass weight is 40 kilos life. So at a kilo and a half a day, it means that live weight gain, that means that they're on the farm an extra month. So it's really important that you do your cost of production to make sure that adds up, that it adds up. You putting on this extra weight, is it gained to grass or is it done in the house? This is your fat class, just, just, just to let you see what the cuts from a, a fat class two animal looks like versus a fat class five. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot to do with aesthetics and how it looks to the consumer the, of the end product. Um, obviously the the ideal spec is somewhere in between these two. So the impact on carcass weight of your end product, this is this is just the line or whatever of a 430 kilo carcass, a 290 kilo carcass, and a 350 kilo carcass. Um, obviously the 430 kilo carcass, um, to get your ideal pack size of 230, 250 grams or whatever, there'll be a very thin cut and it just doesn't look right in the pack. So that's why they prefer this, uh, one of these 350, type carcasses. And the 290 kilo carcass, um, obviously they cut them, they have to make the cut thicker and it doesn't maybe look as well in the pack, so that's why they want something in the middle. Another thing, as I mentioned earlier, there's there's more and more of these premium cattle being, being born. You'll see back in 2016, 18% of the kill were either Angus or Hereford, and that's now jumped up to 27%. Um, and that's expected to continue to increase in the next couple of years. Angus is now the third most popular calf registration to both um, to, suckler, to suckler cows and the most popular obviously beef sire used on a dairy cow. Um, as well as growth here, there's also growth in England following a very similar pattern. So you'll expect similar growth in Angus and Hereford numbers coming through there as well. So this is the beef sales data. Reports in the processors in the last few months have sort of indicated that there's a lot of beef around, there's a lot of heavy carcasses um, coming in, um, as well as a higher throughput, so there's more beef about. To add to that then, there's a lot of beef that was put into storage before our first Brexit date of the 31st of March, and that's now coming back onto the market. Um, so you'll see here that the while these uh, 
sales data is looking quite positive in terms of individual cuts and things. It's that there's just a lot of beef available on the market at the minute. Um, you'll see the most popular one there is like the likes of mini roasting and, uh, and student sticks things like that. They're seeing convenience is key, and that seems to be what is selling well. Like roasting joints uh, have struggled in a lot of the Cantar sales in the last few years. But the likes of like your mini roasting's done really well, like smaller households, like two, three people houses, and maybe products that, um, you know, that'll do one or two meals. That's they, they seem to be doing very well. These are just things. This wouldn't really be my area of work, but or um, education people would look on this. So whenever the housewives out buying, or be for the house husband, and um, what they're looking for is taste, quality, and to suit the whole family. They're also looking for good value for money, easy to cook and convenience. And I just see like beef is do does quite well in all of them, so it's it's still it's still quite positive. Obviously, there's competition. Like you'll all be aware of the vegan and flexitarianism and and all these other sort of um, things coming through. I suppose they're just they're a very small but vocal part of the the consumers. I think a recent study showed that only one percent of the population is vegan. Um, the bigger issue, I suppose, is flexitarianism which is basically where people like reduce their meat intake but still eat meat. So that's about 15% of your population. So they are the, the biggest um, area that we, we should probably be focusing on, getting them back eating red meat. Um, I think LMC done like a study a few months ago, and I think it said that 92% like of adults in Northern Ireland still eat red meat, which is the highest in the UK. Um, uh, so I suppose it's just about maintaining, maintaining that sort of... Uh, level. Next thing is the Brexit problem. Um, I made this presentation in a good few weeks ago and I don't think much has changed since. We still don't really know where we're standing. Um, tariff impacts, if we leave with no deal, these are the tariffs that are going to be applied to everything we export out of here, which basically will switch off um, our access to the EU market because our products just won't be able to compete against the likes of the stuff from the south, um, which means it'll it probably be have to be consumed domestically. Um, not so much a problem for the beef because most of our beef is consumed um, locally, but it does create a carcass balancing issue because um, obviously we want to get all of our offals out and all of that four quarter and other bits of beef that we don't use. So it's the carcass balance will, will, will cause the issue here. Um, the other issue, I suppose, is if they leave the deal and the UK decide to give tariff free access just to maintain the, the beef that's coming from the south. They can't do that under WTO rules without opening it to everyone. Um, so you're opening the back door then to the South American beef. Now they've insisted that it has to be reared to the same standard and all the rest, but you're, you're effectively leaving your market open to, to imports. So as well as the obviously Brexit then, there's a number of other um, challenges that are, that are coming up. As I mentioned, like vegans and, and flexitarianisms and changing attitudes to meat are all things that need to to be to be met head on. I suppose from an LMC perspective, we're still in the schools promoting red meat, eating, we're still out in the retailers promoting it, and we've we've invested um, a sizable sum of money every year in local promotion of, of products. Then you've got the climate change lobby. Um I suppose agriculture be made a bit of a scapegoat in all of this. Um, other sectors have just as high, if not higher, emissions than us. Um, and I suppose it's just about uh, about continuing to challenge that. You've got your antimicrobial resistance, which I suppose you're used to antibiotics and things like that. Um, I suppose in the future, I know from the farm quality assurance perspective, the use of antibiotics is just going to be more closely monitored and, and sort of uh, recorded. Then you've got Brexit that we've discussed, and then we've got um, our lifetime insurance. Uh, coming. This is coming from a red tractor. They want to move everything lifetime assured uh, further down the line. Um, at the minute, they don't... They don't really know how much their beef is lifetime assured, but I think about 65, 70% of ours is. So we're ahead of them in that way, but it's just uh, that could be a big change for us coming down the way because about uh, 10,000 beef farmers in the north are quality assured. So that still leaves eight or 9,000 that aren't your suckler, small suckler producer. I suppose in the last, but it's just continue to produce a fantastic product as competitively as possible and continue to meet the consumer demands, whatever that may be. All right.